Let me for this wholeheartedly thank, on behalf of all Bocconi community, Susan Alesina, who generously supported us in organizing this event. Thank you very much, Susan. And let me also thank Professor Francesco Giavazzi that ideated the event and Professors Eliana La Ferrara and Guido Tabellini that took charge of the scientific conference. The bond between Alberto and Bocconi has been extremely strong despite he spent most of his life in the United States after his PhD at Harvard. Not only graduated at Bocconi back in 1981, but he has been for several years visiting professor at Bocconi University, and so he was mentor for many of our Master of Science students and PhD students. There are plenty of things that each of us can take from Alberto's legacy. Let me simply remark in these brief introductory remarks two of them, which I believe are extremely crucial in these times of uncertainty. The first one is the importance of interdisciplinary knowledge. Professor Alessina has been a pioneer of modern political economy. Modern political economy is a robust empirical field that gets intuition not only from the field of economics, but also from fields like sociology, psychology, and politics, to name a few. In these days of high complexity, this interdisciplinary knowledge is the name of the game for scientific research and also for policy decisions. So thank you very much, Alberto, wherever you are for this. The second one is the importance of human capital and of younger generations. Alberto has been an outstanding mentor, and this today's conference has been a demonstration. We have met many of his disciples that praised his activity over the years. And I believe, again, that the human capital and next generations are really crucial, like we know very well from Next Generation U Fund and PNRR in Italy. So thank you, Alberto, also for this. I look forward to hearing from the distinguished panel, and I leave the floor for the rest of the introductory remarks to President. Mr. Prime Minister, dear Mario, dear Susan Alesina, dear members of the panel, in addition to Professor Draghi himself, thank you all for being here. We are particularly grateful to uh, you, Mr. Prime Minister, who have accepted uh, uh, to be here at this university once again, as you did uh, precisely to honor Alberto Alesina 10 years ago, when you were president of the ECB, and I was not really belonging to this university at that very moment because I was busy elsewhere you know, in a place you know. Uh, you were the guest of honor to the inauguration of the academic year, and you also presided over the uh, dedication of the Tommaso Padua Schioppa chair set up by the uh, ECB to the first uh, incumbent, Alberto. Um, I met for the first time Alberto in 1976, as an entering student to this university. I must say, he was from Broni, near Pavia. Another graduate from this university, from Broni, many years earlier, was Paolo Baffi, the very distinguished director general and then governor of the Bank of Italy. And uh, two features that uh, those two personalities had in common was not only unusual versatility in economic and monetary analysis, of course, but a supreme sense of service and of uh, independence of mind. And Paolo Baffi was a very rigorous uh, deputy uh, uh, governor and first director general of the Bank of Italy who had to pay a price for that. And uh, uh, Alberto was not only a great economist, as uh, this two-day scientific conferences has uh, attested uh, 360 degrees, but he also, he also had 
a great sense of independence, the passion of his ideas, the willingness to discuss his ideas with those of others, and uh, he was not ready to concessions, uh, if not after a very uh, difficult, uh, uh, long uh, uh, discussion in which normally he prevailed. And this spirit of independence, of course, uh, uh, showed especially when the person with whom he discussed was uh, um, somebody who for age or status or temporary position was uh, uh, above him, never intellectually. And I, I must say that uh, for these reasons, in particular age, I had uh, the pleasure of being uh, quite often the target of his very punctual critiques, normally with the, the, the supposed to be moderator on his uh, sideline, Francesco Giavazzi. And uh, of course, the fact that he could do this with uh, the guy that was his mentor at this university, then European commissioner, then uh, at the time uh, prime minister, I believe displayed to his conscience to the maximum possible degree uh, the fact that he was really being independent. This was sometimes annoying in the very short term, but always extremely helpful in retrospect because whether he or they were right or not, which is totally irrelevant uh, here, there was always a great stimulation to look at things on their merit. And I like to believe that this spirit of independence, which is the opposite of the um, tendency to always please those in higher offices, he may have taken from this university and not only from the village of Broni. Let me conclude these remarks by noting that uh, the panel that is about to start is on uh, economic policy uh, in an age of uncertainty. I must say, we had a, an age of uncertainty a few decades ago. Otherwise, how could one explain that some Italian economists born intellectually at that time have been so successful in their academic careers throughout the world? I believe because they were studying and working in a place which, a which was a concentrated laboratory of all possible distortions in, uh, in, at that time. For example, the title of Alberto's thesis was Inflation, Indexation, and Stability, a Theoretical Analysis. Uh, in, at that time, another very different type of economist, but also very distinguished, who also I had the honor to supervise in his thesis, Nuriel Rubini, has, has the, his thesis on the interaction between the rate of exchange and the rate of inflation, the hypothesis of the vicious circle. And Guido Tabellini uh, did something very related to that on the microeconomic foundations of financial intermediaries. Now, we will hear uh, uh, on, on the panel now, in, uh, in an age of uncertainty, may I venture to say that in some respects, the uncertainties which are in front of policymakers right now have something similar to what uh, the situation at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s was. For example, in Italy, one uh, milestone of uh, the improvements of economic policies was precisely in 1982 the so-called divorce between the Bank of Italy and the Treasury, which disentangled some co uh, complex functions in overall uh, economic policy making. Now, so many years later, maybe there are some similar uh, 
problems and uh, the complexities of uh, um, using uh, different policy instruments uh, for different situations, of course, are today also compounded by the fact that luckily many of our countries are deeply integrated in the European Union. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Thank you, dear members of the panel, which we are all impatient to see start. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to invite on stage Prime Minister Mario Draghi, Professor Lawrence Summers, Professor Silvana Tenreiro, and Mr. Lionel Barber for the panel discussion on economy policy in an age of uncertainty. Thank you. I, I'm supposed to say. Oh. Um, I think I'll have to say something before that was us told. Um, <clears throat> vorrei prima di iniziare eh, con le poche parole che volevo dire per commemorare Alberto. Um, vorrei che fossimo tutti uniti nel cordoglio per l'orribile tragedia che è successa ieri in Texas. Le possano le nostre anime essere con quelle di quei bambini e dei loro parenti, dei loro genitori e di tutti coloro che sono scomparsi. Grazie. Well, it's a great honor for me <clears throat> to be here to commemorate Alberto. I want to thank, uh, first of all, Alberto's wife, Susan, and then Francesco Giavazzi was a real force behind this event, and President Monti and Rector Verona for the whole event and this organization. Alberto Alesina was one of the brightest and most influential economists of his generation. His intuitions had a profound impact beyond ac academia and contributed to shape policy across the world. Take, for example, his research on inflation, which was instrumental, I would say, I think fundamental, for the central bank independence to be accepted as uh, an undisputable superior concept of central banking. I, I know that maybe Larry doesn't agree completely about this, but we'll discuss this in a moment. Alessina was never afraid of controversies and tackled them with rigor, open-mindedness, originality. His relentless curiosity, ranging from history to sociology, and anthropology drove his research in new and exciting directions. He was one of the first economists to look at the correlation between inequality, economic growth, and political conflict. And while he was a staunch supporter of the free market, he was concerned about reduced social mobility, which became a central theme in his work. <coughs> Alessina was an outstanding mentor to a large number of students and young academics and a leading voice in the public debate. His columns on Corriere della Sera were essential reading for anyone involved in policy and government, regardless of their ideas. He was a driving force at Harvard 
at the National Bureau of Economic Research, at the CPR, and in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. And he was a source of inspiration for many, full of life, self-deprecating, with an extraordinary team spirit. At this, as this conference shows, his intellectual legacy is huge, just like his heart. We miss him terribly, but we must cherish the time we were lucky enough to spend with him. Thank you. Well, good evening, uh, everyone here. It's a great honor for me to be moderating this panel discussion, to be here in Milan at Bocconi amongst some old friends. And as a former newspaper editor, um, you'll forgive me if I can't resist editing the title of this discussion, because it should be economic policy in an age of radical uncertainty because we've had, if you think about it, in the last two or three years, the plague, now a war, and if not famine, certainly serious food shortages uh, arising from the conflict and war in Ukraine. So, and then we of course have the return of 1970s style inflation that Mario Monti was referring to earlier. So I'm going to turn, first of all, um, to Larry Summers to give us a, a little bit of an insight into this bigger picture and perhaps offering some judicious um, judgments, uh, if you can have that, on policy making to date, Larry. Thank you very much, Lionel. And before I say anything else, uh, I just want to say that the kind of collection of people who have come here uh, today a prime minister, a former prime minister, sitting uh, ministers, so many others, is an enormous tribute to the life Alberto led. And it's also a tribute to the type of life that he led, the scholarly engaged uh, life that believed that better scholarship, better understanding, more rigor, analysis and application of data could really make the world a better place. And I can't think of anyone who better exemplified that credo than Alberto Alessina. And I only wish he could be here to see how much of a difference he made in how many people's uh, lives. I want to start with uh, the area that Alberto and I, the one area that Alberto and I worked uh, together on, and that was the question of central banking uh, independence, where Alberto had done the pioneering work demonstrating that independent central banks uh, generated outcomes with lower inflation. And Alberto and I together tried to clinch the argument by making the point that uh, economists would call nominal neutrality, that that lower inflation did not come with higher unemployment or more volatile business cycles or more variation in real exchange rates or anything else that was adverse. I believe Alberto, along with many others who pioneered the political economy of dynamic consistency issues um, and made the case for the independence of central banks and for the emphasis on that as reinforcing uh, credibility have a great deal to do with the fact that we enjoyed globally 40 years of price uh, stability from the early, from 35 to 40 years, 
from the early mid 1980s until uh, now. It is stunning to me how little graduate students know about inflation. And that's kind of like the fact that medical students don't know anything uh, much about smallpox. It's a reflection of substantial success. Unfortunately, though, success breeds complacency. New generations of policymakers desire that they at least will make new mistakes rather than the same old ones. And so, speaking for a moment for the United States, I think we lost our way in uh, 2021. After a decade in which chronically low aggregate demand had been a problem, we decided that more aggregate demand was good and the most aggregate demand was better. And blowing out aggregate demand would uh, be best. We took an economy with a GDP gap that could plausibly have been estimated to be 2% of GDP. We ran a 15%, 12 to 15% extra GDP deficit uh, stimulus. At the same time, we ran zero interest rates. At the same time, we bought securities at an unprecedented pace including mortgage-backed uh, securities, uh, even as house prices boomed. At the same time, we opened up and allowed a big overhang of savings to be spent. Should anyone have been surprised when that proved to be substantially inflationary? Should anyone have been surprised that when the inflation came, it was much more pronounced in some sectors than it was in other sectors? I don't think anyone should have been terribly surprised. There's room to debate the extent to which there was an error in fiscal policy versus the extent to which there was an error in uh, monetary uh, policy, but I don't think there's much room to debate that there were very substantial errors made for which we're likely to pay a price. Right. And it was because we failed to heed the lessons of Alberto's uh, research in terms of the importance of institutions that fomented responsible policy right. that were paying that price. Right. Thank, thank you, Larry. I've, I've just run out of paper, given the length of the charge sheet. Um, uh, Prime Minister, I'm not going to ask you, put you in the invidious position of looking back uh, a couple of years, um, but I do want to hear, and I think the audience would be very interested in your description and analysis of the pan-European policy response to this multiple crisis, energy prices, inflation, food shock, war. Mm -hmm. Can I say just one word uh, oh, as yes. an add-up to what Larry's just said? Oh, be my guest. Um, one, one thing uh, that we should uh, hope for is that, uh, well, it's taken 10 years for Paul Volcker to come out and uh, to uh, root out the expectations that were in, have been ingrained over 10 years. Hopefully this is going to happen faster this time. The second observation that I'm going to make just very quickly is that Europe's, Europe is different. The uh, situation here is different, uh, um, and only because inflation is much lower, uh, core inflation is much, much lower, um, and, um, and the fiscal expansion is, um, is, is not what's been in the United States by far. It's been much less. 
So uh, the two situations are different. Now, I come to your point. But I, I think Silvana will comment on that after that. So um, the, the um, yes, I mentioned this pragmatic federalism in a speech in Strasbourg recently. Um, the point is this, Europe is now being called to entirely new roles in the world. It's quite clear that uh, uh, Europe needs to build its defense. I'm just starting with that, but I might have started with the energy transition or the uh, ecological transition or the health transition or so on and so forth. The pandemia has taught us that uh, single individual countries cannot cope with certain problems. And uh, that's true for all the problems, the issues that I've just mentioned. And it's going to be truer and truer for other things. So uh, rather than pursuing uh, dreams of, uh, say, uh, 360 degrees federalism that starts with creating new political institutions, which in the end, at least in my view, that's the end game, certainly, one could start thinking about separate issues, separate problems, challenges that need to be addressed. And uh, that will drive by itself towards the search for new institutions. For example, again, take the defense issue. Defense issue, by the way, let me say that to, to say that we have to organize our defense, which is absolutely going to be complementary to the NATO one, it, it doesn't require first and foremost to spend more for defense. As you may know, we spend about three times as much as Russia. So it does take first and foremost coordination. But coordination of defense will easily bring together a coordination of foreign policies more than it is today, and coordination of defense policy, and coordination of logistics, and coordination of production of, in, of uh, defense weapons, and so on and so forth. So the, the, here, the, 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 the pragmatic federalism consists in finding a practical issue that we need to address, practical challenge that we need to address if Europe has to have any meaning in this world. And then move from there. I think that's, that's what I meant by, by that. And uh, so the, by, I stop here. Just a brief um, follow up. Yeah. So you, you are in favor though of a, uh, a reopening of the treaties, a treaty yeah. Discussion. Do you think that the majority of EU member states favor that view? And is it easier without perfidious Albion, better known as the UK? Well, I think so. That's, that's for sure. Uh, but, uh, but that's not enough. Um, I think that other countries will want to go gradually, more or even more slowly. But that means that really uh, asks the question, how could Europe perform the role that it's being called to play, how could Europe address the challenges that it has to face without a greater federalism? And frankly, I, I would say I, ha I don't see any answer to that unless we move forward on that path. Now, the central banks, um, let me be blunt. Do you believe that all the central banks, including the Bank of England, were behind the curve when it came to uh, raising interest rates. And in that context, how would you describe the current policy response in the UK and more generally? Okay, so, um, so let, let me start from uh, the basics, uh, shocks or sequence of shocks to energy and commodity prices is not something that we can reliably forecast, let alone those that are coming from an unexpected war. Um, so there's no way we could have predicted this uh, big increase in, uh, in uh, energy and, and commodity prices more generally that are a big part of the inflation landscape today, uh, both in Europe and in the UK. 
The U.S. situation is different because they are large. They are a large producer of commodities, of course. Uh, but just to be clear, commodity markets and a whole industry dedicated to price futures um, um, markets were not seeing this coming. Um, now, we cannot we cannot predict shocks. Uh, that's why they are shocks. They are unpredictable. What monetary policy can and should do in line with their remits is, when confronted with the shocks, uh, return inflation to target in the medium term, the two, three years horizon. Um, but let's, let's assume for now, and this is very hypothetical, that we, would, we had anticipated the shock, um, including the war in Ukraine. Um, now, I ran these numbers in a, in a recent talk I gave uh, to fully offset the inflation, uh, expansionary inflation that we, we see today, we would have needed to uh, see double-digit unemployment. Given the lags with which monetary policy affects the economy, we should have started tightening and generating this large unemployment in the midst of the pandemic crisis, when the, crisis, when the pandemic was still not under control. And as you recall, a main rationale for the policy response during the crisis was to avert mass unemployment and uh, massive closures of firms so that uh, we prevent the, the deep scarring or hysteresis that we saw before uh, in other episodes. And uh, so the whole rationale was to limit that and ensure that the supply capacity of the economy was not damaged because of a, what should be a temporary shock. Um, so in, in, in that spirit, uh, monetary policy was uh, aiming uh, to do that. As I said, we would have needed to start much earlier, if, uh, but, but that would have been inconsistent with our remits. Uh, not only um, if, again, we try to offset a commodity price shock of, of the nature of what we are seeing, um, that would generate an, a massive undershoot in inflation once this commodity um, um, shock unwinds or uh, stops accelerating. And I should be clear that the perspective from the UK and, and Europe in general is perhaps different from the, from, uh, uh, from the US. For us, uh, as net importers of energy and commodities, this represents a negative terms of trade shock. And as a consequence of that, we are poorer, and this will manifest itself in lower real wages and lower demand. So past this bump in prices, we should see you know, a, a negative effect on demand. Of course, the risk is that these spikes in prices feed into an inflationary um, dynamics, uh, price-setting dyma dynamics, that, uh, and, and that's where monetary policy has to act. And that's uh, why, in the case of the Bank of England, we have uh, uh, raised ri rates recently. Looking ahead, we, we do face a, a very fine balance in, in adjusting these tensions because aggregate demand will, um, will be depressed by this shock. So I, I, I suspect if Alberto were listening, he would have noticed a general um, comfortable consensus that in, there is inflation, but it's also very different conditions in America and Europe. But let me ask you, and I think I'll come to Larry and ask the same question. Um, if, the, if there is inflation, surely workers will respond to that fact, and we may get uh, something like 1970s wage push inflation on top of other factors like energy. Yeah, I mean, th there are two differences from the 70s that I would like to highlight. One is that in the 70s, there was no this uh, very strong and robust monetary policy framework that we have now with an inflation targeting uh, um, uh, framework that is very clear. And monetary policy makers know what they are doing now. Um, back in the 70s, we were still, we were still exploring uh, income policies. And, and in the end, I mean, we know that um, income policies cannot replace a strong and robust monetary policy um, in target, in, uh, inflation targeting framework. Um, uh, it's ultimately policy that um, bears down on demand and affects inflation. The other difference was obviously uh, union power but was much higher in the 70s and, and workers now we, will find themselves in, in a very uh, difficult situation because uh, they will 
be facing very stark choices and uh, their real incomes will have I mean, will suffer. I mean, it's that, that part will not be averted by any monetary policy. Um, um, and again, if we, even if we had started earlier, or perhaps even more if we had started earlier, real wages would be even lower now. Larry? Let me say three things. Uh, first, yes, the United States is very different from Europe or the UK, very different in terms of the amount of fiscal stimulus, very different in terms of the way relationships between employers and employees were broken during COVID, and most obviously very different by the fall in the degree of the tightness of labor markets. So the situations really are uh, quite different. Second, uh, people have this odd view about hysteresis. Um, there's like the nice part of hysteresis and there's the not nice part of hysteresis. The nice part of hysteresis is recessions cast a shadow forward that means lower potential output, therefore it's really important to avoid recessions. That's the nice part. The not nice part is after you've had a recession, potential output is lower. And so you can maintain a lower level of output than you used to think because you've taken this hit to potential uh, inflate, uh, output and if you try to maintain the same level of potential output, then you will overheat the economy. And what I've noticed is that almost every hysteresis advocate forgets their enthusiasm for hysteresis once the recession ends, because what they really are is advocates for expansion all the time. And what we've learned is that that can be uh, quite painful. So I think we have to be very careful about these uh, hysteresis arguments. The third thing I would say is that I think we need to be careful about central bankers who are proud of their frameworks. The United States Central Bank, without any noticeable tut-tutting from the rest of the central banking community, announced in September, in August of 2020, that its new framework was we were no longer going to ever apply monetary restraint because we anticipated inflation, even though monetary policy acts with a lag. In case that wasn't enough, that even if there was inflation, we weren't going to apply monetary restraint until we were absolutely for sure, for sure, that the economy was completely at full employment. And even then, we were going to say that it was okay to have above target inflation afterwards, as long as we had below target inflation for a while. That feels like a framework of shifting from the old idea that we remove the punch bowl just as the party is getting good to a new idea that we keep the punch bowl going until the first person has been taken to the hospital with alcohol poisoning. And it seems to me that it was kind of predictable that that would lead to a more inflationary environment. I think if people had sort of heeded Alberto's emphasis on the political economy of it all and the emphasis of others on the possibility of the radical uncertainty you referred to, we wouldn't have announced a framework of uh, that kind. And frankly, I think that the US Fed is sufficiently salient in the world of central banks that it has reputational externalities to the rest of the central banking community. And so when it announces a new framework and it becomes less credible, that affects everybody else's credibility um, as well. So I, I get very nervous when a central banker says it's all gonna be okay because we have our framework. And I have to say that the Bank of England's serenity in the summer of 2021 is not in 
the spring of 2022 looking to have been borne out. Can I, can I come out to this? I, I I'm not should. saying everything will be okay, Larry. I'm saying that we face a very difficult trade-off and um, in a time of uncertainty, however radical or not it is, um, you need to play with risks. So early in the pandemic, again, the biggest risk was permanent firms closures and uh, mass unemployment. And there was a decision uh, made there that you know, that's the one to avert. Uh, there were risks on the opposite side, um, perhaps not early because you know, early on, as you remember, commodity prices were falling and that um, bear down on, on CPI uh, indices. But, uh, but uh, obviously there was a risk that eventually th that would mean demand pushing against a constrained um, supply. Um, and over time, the balance of, she of uh, risk dipped towards the inflationary side, but uh, it's, it's, um, I, I, I guess um, um, with hindsight, you can perhaps time it uh, a little bit later or earlier, but uh, we're not talking about um, qualitatively different, different responses here. And just to be clear, mm. you, you also said several times that the price in terms of unemployment in the UK was near di double digit, right? 9%. Well, if you wanted to be Which would really have been three upset. times what it was. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not defending you, but I'm just... No, no, no. If, if you really want to over, you know, offset the overshooting inflation caused by commodity prices, yeah. that's, you need to bear down on domestic demand and cost. But I, I, and thought, I thought the former governor of the ECB had it exactly, Please. had it exactly, you <laughs> had it um, had it exactly right in his intervention here when he said that it was really important to act fast for credibility, like in the 70s. Yeah. And the longer you waited and the more you hesitated, the more expectations got entrenched and the more expensive it was. So I don't think. Uh, the nurse who pulls off your Band-Aid slowly and gently does you any great favor. And I think the question uh, with respect to inflation is, uh, goes, uh, goes to how quickly, you should how quickly you should adopt. And if you believe it's all transitory, then you're right. But the transitory view isn't looking so good, isn't looking so good uh, Right now, maybe geopolitical events will play out in the next few months in a way that makes it look good. So let me just widen the scope of the discussion for a moment. There's an awful lot of perhaps loose talk about, oh, it's a terrible word, deglobalization. De um, I much prefer conscious decoupling. Um, do you think that that, how do you assess this, this problem of East and West pulling apart um, China wanting to become more, more autarkic, more self-reliant. Um, and I am going to come to you, Silvana, because I know you've done some serious work on nearshoring and supply chains. But just from, the, from your Rome perspective. The, um, the geopolitical trends seem to point to um, I would say, a situation of serious tension. Whether this translates itself into the deglobalization of the economies, uh, it's to be seen. I mean, so far, we see some sectors like energy, um, mostly energy, really, that's linked to the geopolitical uh, and the war in Ukraine. Um, the grains and the wheat, certainly, uh, the rest, um, in, in spite of the great conflicts with China, continues to, to be what it was. Um, but certainly, the, the geopolitical tensions call for uh, interferences in, uh, in the sort of globalized markets. Uh, we see that we want to contain certain Chinese technologies. That's a constant discussion. Especially with the Americans. Yeah, with the Americans, but also in Europe. And the United Kingdom, by the way, it's been, uh, it's been like that. Uh, we are now, but for instance, take, take the case of energy now. For now, 
we faced, we finally faced this, uh, this de- in Italy, this uh, dependence, uh, economic uh, energy dependence from Russia, uh, that it's now threatened to become um, submission rather than dependence. So the um, immediate response is to prepare a future where we are not going to depend on Russians for gas. So, so you globalize. I mean, you actually use globalization here. You go around the world. We went all over Africa buying gas. We went all over the world to buy, to buy the ships, the degasifiers, uh, and so on. In this way, you see, it's hard to say that deglobalization is just one-way street. Um, there are responses that, I, at least I am not an expert, but I find hard to categorize in a, in a way. Um, that's what I would say now. But I think uh, Silvana wants to say, Silvana's done a lot of work on that. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, yeah, so and we, what we find in, in, in our work is that uh, international trade or globalization uh, tends to reduce volatility in many countries because it it allows countries to diversify risks across suppliers and across uh, buyers. And uh, I think trade diversification will become more important um, as, as we face more extreme weather events with climate change and you know, energy, the energy area is, is a particularly important one uh, on which uh, the results point to in the direction of, of more globalization in order to reduce volatility. I think the risk that, and what we hear today is an argument that in order to build resilience, we, we should reshore, but that seems to be the wrong logic. Uh, reshore where the, are, are there particular favored destinations, do you think? Within the country, or so as if, I think the premise there is that there's more exposure to your own risks, but uh, you know, the, the logic of diversification is that instead you